I feel very comfortable and confident without makeup, um, but I love wearing makeup because I think it's an art form, and I also think it like accentuates the features you already have. I was talking about high school, how I felt like, you know, I kind of needed makeup to feel beautiful. It really stemmed from me not really um, loving myself. I was in a very unhealthy relationship. I stopped caring in school. I stopped caring about my friends. My family home life wasn't really the greatest either. I had my first panic attack at 17. I will never forget it. Uh, I had went to the emergency room and I swear I thought I was dying. I mean, I was on medicine for a long time and I thought like I was gonna be better because I wasn't having the anxiety attacks anymore. Um, because once one started, everything triggered it. I don't know, it worked for a while, but it definitely was not the solution. I can tell anybody who, um, you know, is going through like their teenage years or like just going through like young adulthood and struggling with anxiety or mental health or whatever it may be, is to not throw yourself in other people because I did that. I think just to kind of take the focus off of me, I was like, well, maybe if I put all my energy and love into just this one person, then like maybe I won't feel so, you know, crappy about myself. I don't know what happened in between, but all of the things that I felt when I was in high school resurfaced. Maybe it's because I had suppressed so much childhood trauma that I've had and really adulthood too. I don't know, it just all resurfaced all at once and I felt like my world was ending. I don't want to say that my parents are bad people, but um, they struggle with um, anxiety addiction, also a little bit of a financial problem. Uh, so it's just me, like I take care of myself. And like I said before, like I really struggled with, um, you know, throwing myself into other people, which now I have found out has rooted from abandonment issues. Um, so when you have abandonment issues, you just, you really try to just like feel, that emptiness as much as you can and uh, there for a while and I don't want to say that alcohol became a clutch in my life but partying definitely did like it made me feel good like I felt good when I went out and people complimented me and I felt good when I was drinking and I started going to therapy once a week I'm still going to therapy no, I guess like my self-love journey really came and stemmed from like it's okay to be an emotional person. I've always been a really emotional person, whether it be I, when I get angry, I get pissed. When I'm sad, I get just like so empty. You know, when I'm happy, I'm just like exploding. And I don't know, I just don't know how to get my emotions under control. So going to therapy has really taught me that like, it's okay to be an emotional person. But I really didn't think that for a long time. And then also what I realized is you can have a healthy, stable relationship and friendships with people and not make it all about them and have that perfect balance in between, you know, loving yourself, but also like loving other people as well. You know, you just can't throw yourself all into one person all the time. Because when you're doing that, you're stretching yourself out then. And I think that's where you really lose yourself. Coming from the family that I do, um, I love my family very much. Like, I love my mom and dad very much. Um, but it's hard when your family struggles with addiction. Um, it's hard being on your own. And like, the only thing that I can tell you, and like, I tear up talking about it now because it's just hard for me um, to kind of grasp sometimes, like, uh, you know, why would it, why would my family want me to struggle this hard? But I remember one time my dad was telling me, he was like, because of this, you will be a better person. And um, I really truly feel that way. Like I am a better person because I do everything on my own and I struggle hard, but I work hard for everything that I have. And it makes me appreciate life in such a bigger like way. But this has taught me to be a very hardworking person. And I love that about me now. Um, I enjoy working hard. Uh, I guess what I want to say is be your awkward, quirky self because <laughs> it pays off in the end and uh, just being yourself is just like always the best thing you can do. When I got like older middle school and my mom started to let me wear makeup, 
that's when I started to get into it because we didn't have YouTube kids, okay? <laughs> I learned that on my own. <laughs> I'm serious. And here you'll see that I'm a hoarder. <laughs> I'm also working through it. <laughs> Wow, don't look so excited. Oh, I didn't know. Amazing. Look, good girl. Bless. <laughs> right now, we are at a Bryson's parents call him a little train wreck. He is, he is as ornery as day is long. Uh, you wouldn't believe Dakota is his five-year-old cousin. He's not a big fan of crowds, but all of these people were at the Carterville Methodist Church Sunday for Dakota. This has turned out way bigger than what either of us would have thought of. Barbecue, baked beans, and a silent auction all meant to raise money for Dakota's medical expenses for his next 17 weeks of chemo. Just yeah. didn't see that coming at all. Yeah, she got a hold of me and I, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you what I did next. Doctors discovered Dakota has Wilms tumor, a rare kidney cancer in children, something he and Bryson have in common. Um, we're actually doing genetic testing in St. Louis on May 10th. To try and see if there's any connection. Why there's two family members less than two months being diagnosed with the same, uh, with the same tumor. Bryson's parents, Nicole and John Reed, say their journey is almost over.
but it's been a long one. It's when we're just there as a family, no one, you know, not in the public. That's just when our guard's down and we don't have to have the brave, strong face. So when they heard their family members would soon go through the same thing, it hurt. It's the hardest thing. But Dakota's parents say he's ready for a fight. At two weeks in, shy Dakota is already warming up to hospital staff. Um, and they play like with the kids during all the procedures, and she, that way they forget about why you're there. That way you forget about why you're there. Yes. And every Friday before they head to the hospital, he suits up for battle. Eyes locked on the prize. And what are we doing at the end of chemo? Oh yeah. Going to Disney. Super Dakota, ready to fight cancer and win. It's a rhythm. Pharmacists have the flow of filling prescriptions down to a, well, science. When I get here in the afternoons, I'd say at least 100 to 200. Mason Basler has worked at Logan Primary Pharmacy in Heron for two years. He says the amount of prescriptions he fills depends on the time of day. At like 3, 3.30, that's usually busier than when we're closing around 7. But I definitely, even if it's just like refills or something, I'm definitely kept busy. But an Illinois House bill could affect Mason's workflow. The goal of the bill is to make sure pharmacists aren't overworked to the point that they aren't able to spend time addressing patient issues and concerns and safety issues with those prescriptions. That bill would limit pharmacists to filling a maximum of next. 10 prescriptions per hour. Ben Calcaterra is the president of the Illinois Pharmacy Association and Mason's boss. He says those regulations would not be realistic for most pharmacies including his. So we're talking, you know, three or four hundred scripts that we would not be able to fill each day. Those are patients that will go without their medicines. Now, if the bill passes, pharmacies would likely have to hire more people to fill prescriptions. Otherwise, you could be seeing a whole lot of nothing at the bottom of your pill bottles for days. You know, this is a logistical operational flow issue that needs to be addressed in each individual pharmacy, not necessarily a script limit addressed for the entire pharmacy world. The bill came shortly after a Chicago Tribune investigation okay. showed Chicagoland pharmacies didn't care for their customers properly because they were too busy. But Calcaterra says he doesn't believe those issues have much to do with the flow of small pharmacies and their employees like Mason.